Uh, my talk is on MDCT, that's mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I will explain what it is later for those who are not familiar with that. So MDCT in the treatment of depression and anxiety. Now earlier, Dr. Chok has very kindly went through the, uh, the overview of how mindfulness is utilized in uh, psychiatric treatment. So here I'm going to focus a bit more, uh, zoom in a little bit more on depression and anxiety. Both are very, very common conditions, as we shall see later. Okay, now this is a famous picture, um, a woodblock painting by a Japanese artist um, created in the early 19th century. So what can you see on the screen? Perhaps you see colors, you see shapes. Perhaps it took a few moments to recognize, oh, those are waves. Yeah? So, Sorry, Irene, uh, we yes? have to project the screen because I think the audience is learning. Oh, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, sharing screen. Okay, my apologies. This is uh, the first time I'm doing this kind of talk uh, through Zoom medium. Let's see. Yeah. Who can share? Share screen. Okay. Uh, is this one? Yeah, you're set. Okay. Uh, is everyone able to see? Do you want to maximize the, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay, so this is the woodblock painting I was talking about. So just now, you probably only heard my voice uh, describing it. So now you can see what it is like. Okay, and perhaps you may notice that your mental impressions just now when I was talking about waves, I was talking about colors. What came up in your mind? And now that you, you actually see the picture, um, is it the same or is it different? Okay. So um, why a picture of a huge wave? We are basically in the middle of a tsunami of sorts right now. Yeah, the world is in the middle of a pandemic. Um, mental health is expected to uh, suffer um, across the population at some point. And not only that, I think uh, there are issues to do with uh, the economic situation and 101 other things. Okay, but I, I would also like to invite uh, every one of you, uh, if you are willing to give it a try, to see whether there, were, there has been any other times in your life when you are facing a tsunami as well. Yeah, maybe not, not as big as a tsunami, um, slightly biggish wave, uh, slightly smaller waves. And just consider that that's how life it is, isn't it? Each of us, each of us have faced some kind of waves in our lives. I think Dr. Chok mentioned a bit as, of it as well earlier. And uh, as for myself personally, how I got into mindfulness uh, was because I actually had an accident in 2012, uh, broke my leg, ended up in hospital for five days, was on crutches for six months, uh, three operations. And while doing all my you know, still, still doing my training as a, as a doctor, uh, as a specialist, uh, specialist trainee. And I came across uh, Dr. John kabat book, uh, his seminal book about mindfulness-based stress reduction. The title is Full Catastrophe Living. Okay, so, so it comes from this idea that life is full of this catastrophe, whether big or small, whether it's collective or personal in nature. But it is full of its ups and downs, basically. Yeah, so, so do consider that for a moment. And, um, and let's see how that impacts mental health in general. Okay. okay. So this is from the Singapore Mental Health Study, uh, SNHS, the second one, 2016. Anyone who have attended my talks before probably have seen the previous one, which is done in 2010. So this is the update. It was just published actually, um, couple, yeah, 2020. Yeah. Now, uh, in this uh, edition or, or in this particular study, they actually did the age group analysis. And you can see, um, okay, I, I'm sorry for all the abbreviations, it's a habit um, of mine. So MDD is major depressive disorder. Dystymia is a type of depression that is milder, but is longer lasting. So you can consider these two the first two columns, MDD and dystymia, as uh, both a form of de depression. Yeah? 
uh, GAD is generalized anxiety disorder. Okay, uh, OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, used to be classified under anxiety, but now has got its own uh, separate category. Uh, and AUD is alcohol use disorder. Here I combine um, the substance abuse element and the substance dependence element. So it's a, it's a combined figure, All right? And any mental disorder. So what do you see? Which one has got a larger number? Yeah, so it's, it turns out that uh, people in the younger age group actually has a uh, larger number, uh, larger prevalence uh, incidence of, uh, of uh, mental health disorder. Uh, there are many explanations uh, as to this. Some people argue that it could be because um, people in the younger age group are more knowledgeable about mental health conditions and therefore they are more able to understand and able to recognize when they have certain symptoms. Yeah? So that could be one explanation. Um, other explanations could be that, well, perhaps people who are in the older age group are just more stoic. Yeah, they, they just tahan everything, you know, they, they don't say they don't feel good, right? Uh, and then there is still a strong stigma against mental health conditions. So people don't report it, even if someone asks about it. Now, um, but the other confounding factor, a huge one actually, is the use of mobile phones and electronic devices. Yeah, so internet, which is how we are able to talk like this now, and I'm able to give this talk right now. And yet, it is like a double-edged sword, isn't it? Think about the times when you spend maybe hours on social media, uh, perhaps um, and anxiously worrying about what people might think of you, whether people might like your picture or not, whether you said the wrong thing or not, whether I sh you should have posted that picture or you should have posted that message or not. Yeah. So th those are the kind of things that... Uh, people, young people especially these days, face on a day-to-day -day basis with regards to their interaction with uh, their peers with the world, essentially. Okay? And through this paper, I heard of a new term which I've never heard before. No more phobia. No mobile phone phobia. <laughs> so, apparently, it's, it's a scary thing to be out without your mobile phone. Okay, I, I, I can't say I, 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 uh, I'm able to relate to that very much, but um, yes, if I'm on call and, and my mobile phone died, uh, you know, the battery runs out or something, I'll be very worried because if people need to contact me, they can't, right? But apart from that, uh, you know, but, but apparently that's a very major, uh, that's a common issue these days among the young people. Yeah? So you can see um, mental health issues are becoming more common perhaps in the younger age group. Um, the numbers are showing us uh, such. Yeah, and um, we're just wondering, is it only in Singapore or is it across the world, right? So in the next, uh, in the next scene, um, in the next screen, this is a study from the Global Burden of Disease Study, uh, 2010. There is a more recent version, but I couldn't get a picture. Um, essentially, I'll just summarize it. Yeah? Um, the diseases that used to be common and deadly in, uh, in developing countries, uh, things like malaria, uh, diarrhea in, in, in babies, in the young. So things that used to cause people to die in large numbers uh, have already declined. Yeah? So they stop, people stop dying from these illnesses, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, mental health issues are on the rise, especially a huge rise in developing countries. Now, um, when we talk about mental health issues, we don't just talk about mortality rates. So we don't just talk about people um, having their lives uh, cut short by the mental illness. Of course, that does happen as well, yeah? especially in self-harm and suicide. But um, we actually are more concerned about what is written there as daily. There's uh, disability-adjusted uh, life years. Uh, that is actually uh, a loss of... Um, a year live in good health. Yeah. So so imagine imagine if someone break their leg or, or like like I did break my leg before, and then for half a year I was practically not being able to live normally. Okay. So so that's that's half a daily lah. Okay? <laughs> so and then you have to multiply that by a population and divide that by the number of population per thousand people, and then you get a number. So you get a number and then you count all the mental health conditions and then you can compare them, way, right? So in that sense, it is a fair comparison. And then you can see, uh, what was the largest uh, proportion of depressive disorders? Okay, second one, anxiety disorder. 
Third one, drug use disorder, alcohol use disorder. In fact, uh, the severe, the co psychiatric conditions that we tend to think of as uh, being generally more severe, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, actually take up less space. Yeah, actually take up less uh, daily. This. Why? Because depressive disorder is a lot more common. A lot, lot more common. So that's how we get these numbers. Okay, so where, where, where does mindfulness come in uh, after talking about all this? So essentially what came up in the first two slides, uh, I was talking about treatment gaps. There is a huge need of uh, effective treatment for psychiatric conditions, especially for depression and anxiety disorders. Yeah, and perhaps general stress, you know, maybe uh, it doesn't qualify you for uh, DSM-4 or DSM-5 criteria, but it still makes your life miserable. That, that is something to look at as well, right? So, um, mindfulness, um, how did it come about into psychiatry, into medicine? You can see this is the number of publications, yeah? So the number of papers published um, in, in scientific journals that involves mindfulness, um, to do with the topic of mindfulness. 1975, okay, I, I forgot to put the number there, but it's probably four or five, uh, four or five papers. Okay, so, so very, very low for a very long time, and then suddenly in about 1999, 2000, it starts to pick up, right? By last year, 2019, we had almost 2,500 papers on mindfulness alone. Okay, so, so that, that's a huge, huge number. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't say I've read all these papers, definitely not. Right, uh, but you can see that the interest is there, um, the funding is also there, right? Um, and there are a lot of bright minds working on this. Why? Because there is a need, yeah. As, as we have seen, uh, mental health is really at the forefront. But is mindfulness just for mental health alone? Not really, actually. In fact, when um, Dr. John Kabat Zinn, um, the, the person who's responsible for all this, essentially introducing mindfulness into conventional uh, medical practice. Yeah? He described at the time when he started, it was really, really difficult. Uh, it, uh, there was uh, the understanding, meditation, mindfulness, what is that? No, it's just woo-woo kind of thing. Um, so it was really an uphill battle for him. But he persisted. Um, and his background in heart science, actually, he's a bioscientist, yeah? uh, PhD, uh, in, in a very good laboratory, very good university. Um, so his background in heart science uh, drove him to actually uh, produce a program that can be easily studied, it can be easily replicated. And that's how we get into the state we are in today, um, that mindfulness is so widely accepted now. Okay. So, um, but his initial idea, why he actually created this program and tried to teach mindfulness in medical schools, in hospitals, is because he saw that there is a gap in... Uh, people who fall through the crack yeah, that, that uh, conventional medical practice couldn't really cover, couldn't really address. And right now, well, the gap is still there, right? And we are still working on it. Okay, so um, earlier I mentioned MBSR. So that, is, that was the program that was created by this uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, it's actually a massive investment in time. Yeah? Uh, so when people... Even my patients, if they actually ask about it, uh, I would actually explain it to them, what it takes to actually do an MBSR course and just help them be sure that it is really what they want to do and they can commit to it. Because otherwise, it will just be another form of stress. Yeah? And it might be just so much better for them to just take a simpler course, a lighter course, a shorter course. Okay? So you can see um, the course itself is eight weeks long. Eight weeks, huh? and uh, once a week, every week is about two and a half hours. Okay? Now, pre-COVID, before COVID hit us, uh, usually it is done in person, in a classroom setting. And there can be up to, well, I don't know, 20, 30 people in a room, yeah? uh, all just learning mindfulness, right? And um, it is also recommended, yeah, recommended that people who go for this course uh, do the homework as well, which is about 30 minutes, 45 minutes a day, right? Now think about any hobby you might have. Maybe, maybe you really enjoy gardening, for example. How much time do you spend on it? Do you spend about five to six hours a week on it? Okay, think about uh, reading newspaper. How much time do you spend on it? Right? So it is a massive investment. But on the other hand, 
think about how much time you spend on social media, how much time you spend watching TV, or playing computer games, or phone games, you know, and see if you could make the transition from doing this to doing that, what kind of benefit that would produce in your life, for example. Okay, no pressure, all right? So, but just think about that. Okay, so when Dr. Kabat-Zinn uh, created this program, um, he has this idea that um, it is a very open program. Yeah, it's, the group is heterogeneous. No matter what condition you have, whether you have back pain uh, or you have cancer, any cancer, as long as you're still breathing and you want to attend, you're welcome, right? Whether you have lost both legs or you have a stroke and can't move half your body, you're welcome. In fact, it, it was so open that uh, even doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals also attend the sessions in the same room with the patients. Now, that, that, that was such a radical idea. Yeah, in fact, when I try to introduce that uh, these days, I think uh, there would still be some pushback. All right? But um, that, that, that was how it was at the beginning. Okay? So uh, MDSR, Mindfulness-Based uh, Stress Reduction, um, was this kind of program. Um, after that, about 10, 20 years after, um, other, psych other people in the mental health field, especially psychologists, are starting to get interested, okay? So, um, so one of the most popular uh, alternative of MDSR, in fact, a very specific, for a very specific reason, is called MBCT, and that's what I'm going to talk about later, right? So MBCT stands for Mindfulness-Based Cognitive Therapy, okay? Uh, there are other things, um, probably less well-known, but it's certainly there. If you have attended some of the talks earlier, you would probably have heard about MBTI. That's very, very new, yeah? mindfulness-based therapy for insomnia. We have mindful self-compassion. Uh, we have mindfulness-based eating awareness training uh, for people with eating disorders. We have mindfulness-based relapse prevention for people with uh, substance abuse uh, problems. Yeah? And many other different formats, but all follow this uh, eight weeks program. Okay, uh, and Brahm Center actually created their own program. It's a four weeks long um, course. Yeah. Okay, so um, just a brief comparison uh, because this is a very commonly asked question. Yeah. Um, intensity, I just want to emphasize it's the same. Okay, about 30 hours, uh, 28 hours, uh, 28 hours uh, plus homework. Okay, uh, and ideally there is uh, inclusive of a one whole day of silent retreat in the middle, probably between the six and seven weeks. Now, what, who it is for? Um, for MBSR, very open. Anybody, anybody who wants to learn mindfulness, anybody who wants to learn how to manage stress, I will come, right? MBCT, at the beginning, when it was created, it was specifically designed for people with recurrent depression. Now, why is that? The group of patients with uh, recurrent major depressive uh, disorder, yeah, we know, after several episodes of depression, it is almost as if the brain is uh, conditioned to become depressed. They get a relapse. Uh, they, even after they recover, they, they go back to being depressed very easily. Okay, um, I will talk a bit more later about why this is so. Uh, but just know that, that that's the case. Yeah? And the psychologists are aware of it and they want to create a program that can help these group of patients. Right, so um, the content for... MBCT, there is some mindfulness practices similar to MBSR. Yeah? So we have uh, the meditation practices in various forms. Uh, but we also have the CBT component. CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy. I'll talk about it later. Yeah. And, uh, okay, oh, there it is. Uh, CBT component of MBCT. Okay. Uh, this is not all of it. Uh, this is just a, 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 a snapshot of uh, one of the... In fact, it comes from one of the handouts that I gave to the class at the time. Okay, but, but uh, in this snapshot, it contains a lot, lot of information, right? And it can be applied in so many multiple different scenarios that it is actually good to understand this one and see whether how you can apply it in your own life. Okay, I'll explain that. So situation happens, right? Whether we like it or not, situation happens. Good situation, bad situation, but something happens, right? Uh, perhaps you are on the way to work, rushing because there is a presentation to do, and then the train broke down. Okay, so that, that's a situation. And then you have a thought. Yeah, so take, place yourself in that situation and see what kind of thoughts might come up. Perhaps, oh no, my boss is going to be really upset with me. Yeah, 
oh no, I'm going to be late. Uh, oh no, this is unacceptable. You know, well, why, why can the train broke down in the morning? Right? So those are thoughts. And the thoughts themselves actually brought up certain feelings. Could be worry, could be fear, could be anger. And this is specific to every individual. We all have our own patterns. And this is different from one person to another. So the reason, one of the reasons why I put it up here is that so that you can recognize uh, how it is like for yourself, right? Um, and then from the feelings, uh, let's say you feel angry, right? Uh, how can the train go down? Uh, notice the physical sensations that come with being angry. Perhaps uh, your uh, muscles are tightening up, yeah, as if you are about ready to punch someone. Perhaps uh, you have the impulse to shout at someone or scold someone. Right or type a complaint letter. Okay, so so all, all all these are impulses to act and body sensations. Now change it to a different scenario. Maybe um, let's see. Maybe it's already eleven p.m. and your um your spouse is not home yet or your child is not home yet. Yeah. So depending on the situation, uh, think about what kind of thoughts might arise, what kind of feelings might arise. What kind of impulses might arise? What bodily sensations might arise? Yeah, and, and this works for any 101, 1001 different scenarios, including good ones. All right? So, so um, put some good situation in there and see what comes up for you. What kind of thoughts, feelings, uh, body sensations might arise? Okay, so after you understand this part, um, so what? Yeah, the, the, the thing, one of the reasons I'm putting this up here also is because so very often people miss this part, the thoughts part. Yeah. Um, they get the end result, they they notice the end result, which is the probably the impulse to act, or maybe too late, or the action happened already, maybe you shot at someone already. Yeah, so so that can happen as well. Or in people who are prone to uh, body sensations, feelings in the body, maybe you get the heart beating fast, or you feel sweaty, or you feel shaky or tense. So you get the end result, but you a lot of people will miss this too, uh, often, right? So um, I'll give you an exercise after this and uh, see whether uh, you can illustrate what I'm talking about. Okay, just read the sentence one by one, right? John was on his way to school. Okay, just do it. Uh, just read the sentence uh, and do it slowly and just noticing what comes up in your mind. Uh, what picture do you have in your mind right now, for example? Who is John? Maybe you are questioning who, who is John. Or maybe you have a, an image, a mental image already of how John might look like yeah, and how the school might look like. Yeah, so so uh, noticing all these uh, internal experiences, just being aware of them. Um, no need to be like super focused or anything. Yeah? Just, just casually. Casually, just do it for fun kind of thing, right? Um, or with a bit of curiosity as yes, we call it sometimes. He was worried about the math lesson. Okay, so now you, perhaps you have a slightly better picture of who John is in your mind, perhaps. Okay. Okay, then the third sentence, he was not sure you could control the class again today. Okay, no, notice what's arising. For some, it could be like, hey, what's happening? How come you need to control the class? You see the class monitor, All right? And the last sentence was not part of a security guard's duty, right? At, at this point, usually people laugh if I'm giving the talk in a room because suddenly their expectations turn upside down. This is funny exactly because of that, yeah? So um, just an exercise in noticing your uh, thoughts. Now, if you do it quickly, if I just show all the, um, all the lines straight away and you read it up, probably will take like three seconds to read, right? Um, you miss the thoughts in between and the expectations in between and the question in between, uh, probably. All right, because it happens so fast. Yeah? Okay, so again, why mindfulness? Why, why, um, why mindfulness might be helpful in uh, people with depression or anxiety? So, um, okay. If you have been watching some of the presentations, um, it will come up again and again, so I didn't put it up um, today. Uh, definition of mindfulness, yeah? uh, learning to pay attention in a very specific way, moment by moment attention in a non-judgmental way. 
all right so they they emphasize the moment by moment part present moment awareness all right and uh, non-judgmental but actually there are a lot more to it than that and if someone goes for an mbct class for example or mbsr class any mindfulness class taught by a teacher okay um these attitudes will be taught sometimes explicitly sometimes they write it out on the board sometimes um, there might be a short explanation on it uh, or sometimes it's just through um indirect means yeah but just by modeling modeling patience modeling acceptance modeling non-striving very important right um I'll pick up, I think some of them are quite obvious already, so I won't talk so much about non-judging and all that. Um, Non-striving, very important concept uh, in mindfulness and very difficult to understand, right? Because I totally, totally understand that people go for mindfulness classes because they want something out of it. Okay, there is a goal in mind. Otherwise, why would you want to go? Yeah, why would you want to go to any class you know, if you don't want to accomplish something, isn't it? Right? So that's totally understandable. But uh, remember in mindfulness, uh, there is a paradox, yeah? That you are trying to do nothing, essentially. You are trying to learn to do nothing. And if someone happens to have anxiety or depression and want to have some benefits out of mindfulness, in fact, that's the first thing to understand, to let go of expectations, non-striving. Um, so you sit, you follow the instruction, you sit, you watch the breath perhaps, or you walk and you watch the movement of the, of the feet, you feel the movement of the feet, or any of the other sessions of mindfulness. You just follow the instruction and you leave it open. Um, you don't expect for immediate results, you don't expect to have this experience or that experience, right? You don't expect things to be pleasant even, because sometimes they are not pleasant when you actually do mindfulness practice, right? So there is that non-striving element, just um, doing things uh, just so. Um, letting go is another important one. Um, often, very often, it is uh, mistaken or misunderstood as um, I should let people walk all over me. Yeah, uh, people do anything to me, also I have to accept. Uh, okay, letting go and acceptance, uh, these two. Letting go is about the past usually, right? Uh, or about something that uh, is uh, weighing you in your mind yeah, and acceptance. So often people think that uh, whatever happens, you know, if people treat me badly or anything, um, I just have to accept that because uh, that's what mindfulness is, right? Okay, but the answer is no. Okay? <laughs> so mindfulness doesn't mean that you become passive and non-thinking at all and cannot do anything at all, uh, let people walk all over you. It's totally not like that. Yeah? But it is the idea that within your internal experience, things already happen. If you feel angry, if you feel angry, the anger is already there. Yeah? If you feel uh, you are being wronged, the event probably already happened. Yeah? And what you have now, right now inside, is the thought that you have been wrong. Okay? So that, that's, that's the part uh, that will be emphasize again and again. Why? Because again, mindfulness is uh, the ability or the awareness of present moment experiences. And where is our mind most of the time? Uh, in the past or in the future, right? In the past, just keep going through and through over things that already happened, usually bad things. Um, in the future, keep worrying about scary things that might happen in the future. And that's just how it is, right? So in the practice, we again and again, we just bring it back, bring it back to the present moment. What's here right now? Sitting, breathing, feeling the ground under your foot, under your feet. Just noticing. Right? Okay. Now, earlier I uh, mentioned a little bit about wandering mind. Why is it a problem? I mean, it's okay, what, you know? Um, Think about something pleasant, and in fact, um, that, that's what sometimes people tell other people, isn't it? If you see a friend being sad or depressed, and then you tell them, oh, you know, just don't think about it, lah. think about something nicer, think about something more pleasant. Yeah? So we, we are really conditioned, um, whether personally or through society, uh, to first not to accept uh, 
negative events internally, yeah, to, to have difficulty accepting things uh, in the inner world, and also to distract ourselves, um, primarily by mind wandering, but now uh, handphone and uh, internet probably take up second space already, right? So uh, this study is an interesting one. I don't know if I have time to talk much about it, but um, essentially it's a study uh, with, through, done through mobile phone, right? Uh, with thousands and thousands of respondents. Okay, so they have thousands of data points, uh, which if you sign up for the study, they will uh, send you a message at random times, really random, yeah, really random. You can see there is one point here, so, so it's really random, right? Um, really random times and ask you two questions. What are you doing right now? Uh, three questions actually. What are you doing right now? Is your mind focused on the task? Right? And how happy are you feeling right now? Right? So what are you doing right now? You can see some people are working, resting, sleeping, commuting, exercising, shopping. Uh, is your mind focused on the task? Uh, are you present? Um, are you uh, being aware of what you're doing? If the answer is uh, no, then uh, your mind might be wondering, right? Uh, not, not focus on the task, that means you're doing something else. Your mind is doing something else. It could be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Yeah, so pleasant mind wandering, unpleasant mind wandering or neutral. Okay, but you notice here, not mind wandering, you are focused on the task. All right, and it turns out it is actually slightly better. The mood, the, the how you are feeling when, when your mind is not wandering is even slightly better than pleasant mind wandering. And this is regardless of what task it is you are doing. Okay, and this is a combined result. So you can see it's regardless of us. Okay, so um, a little bit more about, I'm almost done, a little bit more about default mode network. Um, this is, okay, in the past, people used to think that when you are not doing anything, that means you are just zoning out or just sitting, not doing anything, right? Your brain actually is not working very much. But surprise, surprise, when people start studying the brain at rest, uh, awake, eh? uh, not, not sleeping. Um, although sleeping also got, still got things going on. But uh, when the brain is awake, at rest, not doing anything, actually is very busy. It's actually really busy. And now in neuroscience, they talk more about networks, yeah? large networks in the brain, rather than specific brain regions. So a network is a... Uh, connection between several regions that kind of fire up together. Yeah? So this is called the default mode network because this is the network that is active when you are not doing anything. But in fact, what your brain is doing is thinking about the past, thinking about the future, or thinking about yourself or thinking about others. So, so these are the normal activities of the brain when you are not doing anything. Okay, so you, you can see that mind wandering actually is kind of like pre-programmed already. Yeah, it's a natural state for most people. Uh, unfortunately, we also know that now, now we also know that the, this um, default mode network or thinking about the past, the future, and all this mind wandering thing are actually linked to uh, depression, anxiety, and chronic pain. Right? So, well, that's just how it is. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why uh, there are so many of these things happening these days. Uh, the incidence is on the rise. And what meditation does actually is reduces activity in this region, in this network. So the whole network just come down and relax and rest when you're actually meditating, right? And what else is happening when you practice meditation? How, how does mindfulness meditation actually work? So there are a number of studies that uh, cover this area. Uh, I just want to highlight one. Um, there are other studies, but all pretty much about, about the same things. Yeah? Um, so we have things like uh, attention regulation. Um, attention regulation is the ability to notice when uh, your attention has wandered and then bring it back. Yeah, so wandered, bring it back. That, that's, one, that's, that's like mindfulness 101, isn't it? Uh, bring your attention to the breath, keep it there, or try to, right? Because we know, we know for sure it is going to wander away. Uh, that, that's just how the mind is. Yeah? So the mind will wander away, bring it back. Wander away, bring it back. Okay, so, th so that's attention regulation. Uh, body awareness. Um, in mindfulness, we do a lot of body awareness exercises as well. Yeah? And uh, there are some studies that link this enhanced body awareness to improve mood um, and reduction of anxiety and stress, essentially, uh, and pain as well. Yeah? Um, emotional regulation. Okay, so, so 
the capacity to be uh, calm regardless of whatever is coming up, whatever emotion is coming up. In other words, you can notice anger arising, you can notice sadness arising, anxiety arising, and you don't need to add salt to the wound. You don't need to make it worse by thinking further or reacting further to the emotion itself. Because that is what often happens in uh, things like panic attacks, for example, yeah? um, or in depression. So let, let me just take an example of a panic attack, just a few moments, because it's a common situation. Um, so often, in a, for people with uh, recurrent panic attacks, so they, they usually have had more than one already. Yeah? So they know what it feels like. It is very scary. Uh, if you haven't had it, just take it from me that it's, it is very scary. Yeah? Uh, people often end up in the a &E department thinking that they have had a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, right? But the fact is that they only have a panic attack, but it is very scary. So uh, after a few rounds like that, the person usually starts to develop um, what we call um, hyper awareness. Then, yeah? so, so they, they hyper vigilance. So they start uh, noticing very, very well, uh, noticing any changes in heart rates or any changes in uh, chest tightening, any symptom that they associate with a panic attack, for example. Um, and any little bit that comes up, the mind straight away will jump to the idea, oh no, a panic attack is coming. Oh no, I cannot cope with it. All right? So, so that, that's a common scenario. And um, again, with mindfulness practice, and I cannot say this is an easy process. In fact, um, it may be quite tough at the beginning. So do be gentle with yourself if you do have panic attacks. Uh, at the beginning, it may be a bit tough. All right? uh, but after a while, people do develop that ability to just see the sensations arising, the emotions arising, and not make it any worse than it already is. Okay? So, um, emotional regulation, okay, so that, that's still around the same region like that, not reacting, and a change in perspective. Yeah? Uh, this is not uh, what is sometimes in psychology or psychiatry, we talk about dissociation. So, this is totally not it. This is uh, just the idea that uh, we are who we are, uh, I'm like this, I'm like that, I'm this kind of person, I'm that kind of person. Yeah? Um, so just uh, know that at some point, it, it may not be so fixed anymore. I'm talking about something that may be useful in mental health. For example, uh, some people may consider themselves to be, I, I'm a loner, right? I, I'm a loner. I, I don't like talking to people. I don't like being around people. Okay? Um, but you know, after, after some mindfulness practice and all that, uh, they might start seeing themselves in a different light. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I, I prefer to be alone, but um, it's not so bad being around people after all. <laughs> so <laughs> that's our thing. And we do know that that, that can help mental health as well. Yeah? Um, okay, so is that the last slide? Oh, right, it is. Okay, so, so thank you for uh, listening to the talk. And uh, I guess we will go on to the, to the panel discussion. Yeah, that's a go.